Hi, and a very warm welcome to the BSBA Dialogue series at the Berlin School of Business and Innovation. BSBA Dialogues is a series of webinars dedicated to innovation, which looks and focuses on the need of new and improved use of technology in higher education. Our topic today is blended learning, and we'll be discussing if this is the new model of education methodology. As, as we experience the impact of the fourth industrial revolution, it has become apparent that education is also affected, and new models and norms are on the rise. In this framework, blended learning is um, blended learning is the most dynamic model uh, of education, not only for the future but also for the current for the current situation. In this webinar, we'll be discussing about the different elements of blended learning. We'll take a look at blended learning compared to conventional learning. We'll talk about the benefits and some of the challenges of blended learning, and we'll also talk about its implications on the future of global education. I'm Jackson Neto, the Communications Manager at BSBI, and your moderator today. Joining us in the panel is Professor Kuriakos Kovaliotis, who is our Programs and Partnerships Director. Hello, Professor. Hello. Hello, Jackson. Hello to everybody. Professor, could you tell us a bit about yourself and what you do at BSBI? Right. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the Programs and Partnerships Director of, uh, at the BSBI. Um, I used to be uh, a rector and a provost in uh, many European institutions so far in uh, my career for the last 20 years. Um, I have um, um, been researching this particular domain, uh, blended learning, distant learning studies and e-learning uh, for the last 15 years. I have designed my own model for uh, the future of education, which I call it the synthesized learning, which uh, is composed of what we're going to discuss today with some other norms uh, and innovations that probably we'll have the chance to discuss at the last part of the webinar. Um, I have written around 15 books and 400 publications, and uh, currently I'm focusing in developing um, some areas in uh, BSBI and uh, promote its, uh, its uh, innovations further. Uh, back to you, Jackson. Welcome, Professor. Also joining us in the panel is psychologist Julia Schaefer from the Hamburg University of Applied Science. Hi, Julia. Hi, Jackson. Hello to everyone. Julia, could you introduce so Mm -hmm. So I'm a psychologist and I'm as well a teacher and trainer for teachers. Uh, currently I work at Hamburg University of Applied Sciences. Uh, we have a, um, we have a, bi a bilingual study program with a double degree. Um, this study program is for mechanical engineering and our students, they are based in Shanghai in China. And they, they, so they have um, courses in Chinese, of course, and also in German. And what we basically do in our, um, in our project, we design and implement e-learning components for the students to get a better understanding of German language and to support them. Uh, so it's about content and language integrated learning, CLEL. Thank, Thank you. you. Also joining us in the panel, our final panelist is Professor Dr. Malke Pazika, who works as a scientific director at the Center for Teaching and Learning Services at RWTH Aachen University. Professor Dr. Malke, warm welcome. Hi, um, hi to all um, viewers and listeners. Yeah, I'm 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 scientific director of the Center for Teaching and, and Learning Services. My center provides um, everything associated with digital teaching for the whole. Um, our, our WTH Aachen University. We uh, we create serious games. We uh, do the electronic exams. We do the video uh, production for for our teachers. Uh, we um, we make courses for for teachers to to improve their teaching. So 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 every every service you can imagine around teaching and and um, and learning um, we provide. And I, I see to uh, to the finding of, of empirical evidence that shows us that what we do is actually effective. A very warm welcome to you all. Uh, thank you. It's great to have you here. Um, go on to the next slide, which is about the agenda. So on the agenda, we have put down a list of four topics which we'll be taking a look at in detail during this webinar. We'll start off by giving an insight into what is blended learning before moving on to comparing uh, blended learning with con conventional learning. We'll talk about the different benefits uh, and challenges of blended learning. And as a final point, we'll discuss the future of global education and the future of blended learning, of course. Uh, at the end of this webinar, there's a Q&A session where you can ask our panel of experts any questions that you may still have. 
let's get started. So our first topic is, what is blended learning? Over to a panel of experts. Uh, um, well, I could start if you want. Um, I can give you a short introduction how it works at Shanghai Hamburg College. So what uh, we do is uh, students have face-to-face -face classes and um, well with a teacher or professor and um, they also have uh, well classes online so they have online modules they have to uh, do exercises online they have to upload uh, well documents online they have to do online discussions and all the input online well comes back to face-to-face -face lessons so it's always about what happens in face-to-face -face lessons is always connected with what happens on the online platform and the other way around as well. I would, I would, I would add that um, that the traditional in in that sentence may not be that traditional anymore because, um, of course, we we strive to not only provide digital learning and teaching in the in the in the distance learning when uh, when students uh, enter into the self-regulated phase of learning, but also digital tools that can be employed in the classroom, uh, so like uh, collaborative tools or audio response systems, um, things like that. that. So, uh, so um, I, I think we, we not only see a shift when it comes to self-regulated self, self learning towards the digital space, but also to pimp up our, our, our classrooms with, with, uh, with the digital tools that uh, students can use while doing face-to-face -face learning. That's that's the first thing, and the second thing is that, um, given the the current um, Corona crisis, I think we are seeing that that blended learning is virtual and virtual learning. So all all of our teachers try try to try to blend this this idea of blended learning with with the circumstances that that we we are facing right now. That's quite good. Yeah, that's a quick your take on this. Yeah, so uh, by hearing uh, my two colleagues uh, providing you this uh, set of examples, uh, you can understand that um, uh, blended learning also presents uh, something different, something that uh, we're not accustomed to, let's say, five or uh, ten years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And not just because we have now the current uh, uh, corona public health crisis globally, but also because technology has enhanced all uh, the tools and instruments that we have at our disposal in order to progress education further, we can say that not just blended learning is the future of education, but maybe it's uh, the future has already come here, uh, which means that um, if we want to give a definition um, considering uh, what we have said so far and what are uh, experience uh, from blended learning is because lately as you know everybody started discovering synchronous and asynchronous platforms hybrid learning blended learning virtual learning everything now is very hot and trendy let's say but for us that we are in the particular education sector for uh, many many years um, this is a, a, the perfect opportunity for us to project some of the work uh, that has been done all these years and this evolution of education. So um, in the previous slide, uh, you could see these three spheres. Um, so thank you, Jackson, for bringing this back. Um, yes, with online learning, face-to-face -face learning, what we call vis-a-vis -vis in Latin, and blended learning is the area that both these spheres uh, are united. So we bring together the two basic norms of delivering education and didactics that we know today. So some of us, they call it also the hybrid education, like what we're doing in cars with uh, electric power, petrol and diesel and gasoline. But in, in education, as you can understand, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, however, this is how it actually works breaking together these two different norms. So um, a typical definition that we can actually find it everywhere, and you can also um, understand it from the examples that my colleagues gave you, 
Blended learning is an approach to education that combines online educational materials and opportunities for interaction with the traditional uh, uh, based platform um, and classroom methods. So it's a combination, as I said before, of what uh, we have so far. So it requires the physical presence of both the teacher and the student or the participant, if you want, like what we are doing now. This is a classic example uh, that brings together all these different norms. Also with some elements of control over time, place, path, um, and so on and so forth. So um, we can have online sessions like this one, which is a synchronous method, and we can also have a pre-recording or video lessons that is the asynchronous method. So um, combine this with a physical presence in a class or in an amphitheater or in a seminar room, and you have blended learning. So um, the issue here is not just to present these basic definitions and explain what is blended learning, but to have in mind that this new concept presents a lot of different opportunities. And to give just one example, and then we can move forward, in uh, one of the universities that I'm currently teaching, the, which is also a partner of BSBI, the Unitetuno University in Rome, um, we have a lot of famous professors. Um, uh, for example, we have Romano Prondi, the ex-director uh, of the European Commission, that he's teaching the history of European integration. Or we have Mario Monti, who was also a prime minister in Italy, and he was responsible for the evolution of the euro when he was in the European Commission. He is teaching the economic and monetary union of the EU. So we have used these professors uh, and asked them to provide a set of video lessons. They are the top in their fields to teach these particular subjects. So you understand that it would have been impossible to have this kind of quality professors in con conventional universities or with a conventional face-to-face -face lectures unless you invited them uh, for a very limited time as guest lecturers. But that would have been impossible to, to share this knowledge uh, around the globe. But in a blended learning form, which is to pre-record their video lessons and make them available to all our students in combination with our professors with face-to-face -face lecturing, that's the ideal package to give to the students. Imagine, for instance, because I also think we, we have him as a guest lecturer as well, um, to have a course which is about the um, former Eastern European countries um, and the political situation in the former Eastern Europe. And we have Mikhail Gorbachev teaching this, which is, which is amazing if you think about it. Or I don't want to, to forget anybody, but a, a, lot, a lot of professors. You can even have a session of multiculturalism by the Dalai Lama. So that presents uh, not just a new model, but a, a, a whole set of new opportunities. Um, so I'm going to stop here now just to uh, keep the discussion going. And, and, but you can grasp how interesting it is, okay? Absolutely. Uh, it opens up a world of lots of possibilities, especially it connects all of us in this global, global digital era. Um, if we have nothing else to add to this topic, we could move on to our next uh, topic, to a panelist. So we will um, go into our next slide, which where we'll be taking a look at, oops, it's frozen. There we go. We'll be taking a look at, let's take a look at the comparison between blended learning versus conventional learning or traditional learning. And of course, if I, uh, I may add uh, for this, which I think you will find it fruitful. Um, when we say versus, that doesn't mean they are in competition to each other. Uh, it's, it's, it's more to, to find a way to, to actually blend them, as, as the word itself says, than to have them in the opposite ends of the spectrum. And this is exactly what we should do. And if we combine this with also the latest evolution in technology, we can say now that technology is not just providing a helping hand in uh, delivering uh, education. It has generated a methodology on its own. And we have to understand this statement because that changed the way we perceive education now. Um, so have this in your mind and if you look at the uh, at the slide, and you can see what 
traditional learning is doing and what uh, blended learning is doing, um, you actually uh, move to the blending learning model um, uh, by yourself. It, 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 is, it is something that maybe education actually waited for a couple of centuries to be involved. Um, so uh, back to our uh, our colleagues to to hear their comments and uh, uh, and their interpretation of this. Julia Malta, I would like to add something. So when we have a look at um, at the table here and it says learning time, I mean, of course, it's a it's a huge potential that blended learning means you can learn anywhere, it's flexible. So for example, I give teacher trainings uh, with people from like all over the world, from Latin America, from Asia, from, well, the whole globe. And it's it's really, really interesting, but I also see um, the difficult part here. So um, for example, in my teacher trainings, um, I always uh, ask for feedback and many teachers often say and as well as students um, that they can't handle um, having flexible time schedule so they first have to get like adapted to it and to realize what is the potential and what is a positive aspect but you can't just say okay you can learn when where, whenever and wherever you want to but it has to be done let's say in one week so people kind of struggle with it not everyone but um, I think it's also a challenge like to offer the yeah like the right setting and to offer support um yeah to to face to face this problem with the flexibility of time and with autonomous learning so literally people have to be really organized if they want to make sure they get the work done whereas in a, in a traditional learning they are in the classroom they have no other choice than to sit there do the studies and then leave within those eight hours so i, I can see your point um Literally, we'll need some more some assistance with people getting organized or students getting organized. But, but um, I would I would I would object to to part of this table because um, in blended learning we have the traditional in in class setting too. So so only for the distant part uh, for the self 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 regulated learning part um, we have this 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 flexibility in. In, in location as well as the flexibility in learning time, and 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 also there only if we do not use synchronous um, collaborative uh, tools like like a webinar or 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 a web conference. Um, and um, in in class we of course still have a a bound location because we have to be in class. Uh, and uh, and also about time, um, students have to be in class when I am in class. So um, so so these these two um, points on this slide are are a bit misleading when when it comes to the face to face part of of blended learning. So we still have a, a asynchronous self regulated learning and we have synchronous learning um and and so so with the advent of uh, digital um, uh, collaboration tools um this the synchronous part um also moves over into in, into the digital realm so um this this table may not reflect uh, these 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 use cases um uh, uh, fully well, what are some of the um some of the examples that come to your mind with regards to blended learning versus traditional learning, um, like what are what are the differences or what are the com uh, comparisons? Professor already mentioned a few of them. Uh, according to you and Yulia and Malta, what comes to your mind, like from your experience? Yeah, but for me, it's 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 um, it's that that we that we need to, that we've with with ben, with blended learning um, for the first time many. Many teachers, many 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 lecturers um, who who adopt this this teaching strategy um, are are faced with the problem of how how to guide the self the the self regulated learning part. So where in the past we might have given our students a, a textbook and said, well, for the next week you you try to remember um, um, chapters. One four and and the assessment whether 
the contents were understood or not happened in class. Now we need to, or we have the chance with, with uh, say, electro electronic quizzing or, um, or, or digitally um, 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 reviewed um, homework assignments, we, we have the chance to uh, provide feedback while doing self-regulated self learning. So th this for me is one of the most, most crucial parts that, that, that we not only interact with our students um, during class, but we also set up interactions or at least feedback routes to our students and from our students while they are not in class. That's, that for me is one of the most, most important and also I, um, I think mo most learning, learning, learning effective parts of, of blended learning. Second thing is that, that all my students tell me that their workload um, increases significantly because uh, we, with, with, um, with having more control over the self-regulated learning part of blended learning, um, we make sure that students actually do it. So, the, so they, they, they not only need to attend class, but we, we've, we force them or guide them uh, to, uh, to, uh, to also work, uh, work at home um, stringently. Uh, so uh, the workload increases. For many students, at least. Students, that's quite good to know. I fully agree with you, Malta. But I want to add one point. So I think, um, yeah, I think it's all about intensive course planning. So, yeah. well, you have the, of course, the strategy, and then you start planning. And um, of course, you need knowledge about didactics, methodology, and this course planning is about. So we have different learning format. We have different didactics, different methodology. Um, for example, what do I want to do? Do I want the students to work together individually? So it's about modality of the social arrangement. It's about communication. Do I want to have them a discussion, um, I don't know, in a forum? Or do I, have, do I want them to have a discussion, uh, like a synchronous discussion or whatever? And um, how can I evaluate uh, the outcome? So I think what is the most important aspect is a very, very intensive planning. And this is where I also see that teachers or professors often struggle because, I mean, it's not completely new, the idea of blended learning or the idea of learning online in general, but um, well, there, like, as far as I can tell from my experience, there have not been that many trainings for teachers. And, most of them were asked to like okay there there's a new method just use it and you can decide how you want to do it and i think that's when it often fails or when it's not as satisfied as it should be yeah the other side of blended, blended learning. learning essentially um, requ requires lecturers to replan much much of of, of their course design um, if if they want to implement a full-blown blended learning strategy, then the um, particularly the the, the in-class portion of teaching um, significantly changes. Um, you do uh, seriously different things with uh, with your students as 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 you would have in in traditional learning. So so that requires teachers to to remodel their their whole course design. Uh, and I, I also have the experience that teachers are are often over overwhelmed by by this task, and um, that that leads to to um, to well, let's say lacking success. We uh, saw that um, at at uh, here here in in Aachen, uh, where our economists um, um, implemented a flipped classroom strategy, which is the flip the blended learning format so students watch watch videos at 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 home and then they they enter class and 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 they do projects or or assignments gu guided by their teachers uh, and they are really successful with uh, with this design they they were in fact so successful that our construction engineer said well flip classroom that that's the way to go let's let's implement that too and and they failed um they their flipped classroom model, um, although it was modeled precisely after after what uh, what the economists had had done, 
did not resonate with the with their students. Students were um, were were not happy with uh, with this new teaching teaching methodology. So that our construction engineers went went back to to more traditional forms of teaching. Um, that's a very um, key key learning for me that you cannot just just adopt a a a, a strategy that has proven itself. Uh, elsewhere and expect it to work just as fine um, in, in your own setting. Professor, would yeah. you like to? Well, if I may add to that, um, um, which some of the um, case studies that we discuss are extremely interesting and it also generates a lot of discussion, uh, which is actually of one of our purposes. Um, Split classroom, which is a method that um, actually comes to provide some answers to what we call self-paced uh, learning uh, norm, which is each one of us, including children, they learn in a different pace. Uh, so what flipped classroom is doing, it leaves the student and the participants the time to learn on their own time uh, at home. So when they come back, uh, to the classroom, they they are supposed to use this time effectively in order to interact with each other, to talk to the professor or the teacher, and and in that way use the classroom time in a more fruitful way than in the past. For this to work, we need two very important denominators. The first is to teach the professors and teachers uh, with a lot of examples and active case studies because. Otherwise, maybe some of them, the, the old traditional ones, they can actually react or be against that. And they really need to believe and to adopt this methodology. And the second, uh, we need a set of, let's say, small wins. So we have to do this gradually, not changing all these kind of systems uh, just next day. To give you an example, the, this uh, the same problems were encountered when we tried to introduce the STEM methods, that is the science, engineering, um, 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 and 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 all all the other uh, domains that they come in that. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, uh, although some of the professors or the teachers that were really keen on technology, they actually embraced that, but there were others that they were a little bit against. So um, we need to do this properly, gradually, and first we need to educate teachers and professors. And of course, uh, when we, if we move this to, to blended learning, uh, it's not like we have a camera or we're using Zoom or WebEx or Skype for business and we just continue to do what we did or like talking to our friends. Otherwise, everybody would have done it. It's not that. It's much more complex. Uh, it, it, to give you to give you the, an example, it's like when we started distance education 30 or 40 years ago, and we used to receive didactic material via the post, like like a normal book. It's exactly the same paradigm as now we are using uh, electronic platforms with the learning. Huge difference. So it's it's the same for blended learning. So we need to educate the providers first and to educate them here, not just provide, a, a, um, we heard this expression, a cemetery of PDFs and, and handbooks and, uh, and this kind of prospectuses. So the real change is internal. Um, so that's why I said that, uh, method, that, education, that technology also gave to education a new methodology on its own. So we have to keep everything good from traditional and conventional learning. And I, I don't see why to only have blended learning from now on. We, we are not in compete with all these um, uh, different methods. And this particular slide was drafted in order to produce this kind of, uh, of exchange of ideas on purpose. So uh, if you think about it, uh, you can always have blended learning as the single method of learning. It's not bad, for instance, for any children or uh, for any students to go back home and also have an online version of this course. Imagine that somebody is sick one day. He or she can attend this at home. 
or uh, students or children in remote places or when we have this extreme uh, crisis management situation like now with COVID-19. Uh, uh, so that's a whole set of opportunities but in order to avoid putting everything in a melting pot we need to do this in a very professional and organized way and this is a challenge on its own um, and I think people, students uh, and children are already very prone to accept this kind of uh, new methodologies and new norm. I will give you an, idea, uh, an example. When in the beginning of uh, the previous century uh, in New York, they, need, they decided to change from the old carriages with horses to go to the steam cars, it only took four to six years to make this change. Now, these kind of radical changes, they only need a couple of days or a couple of weeks. You can see how our lives change and how well, well, most of us adapted to this particular crisis. So it's also the same challenge for education. I would say I'm, I'm, I'm positive. In any crisis that the world is going to face, people, they need to educate themselves. So I stop here because I talk a lot. Can I add something? <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Uh, so I think I think Professor Kyriakis, what he mentioned is, well, it's all about change management, and I mean it's similar to change management in companies. And now we talk about change management, for example, at universities. So uh, I think we have to go like one step back and to talk about the strategy of digitalization. So first of all, we would need to have a very well designed strategy. So it's not only about like top-down process. So from next month onwards, you will use uh, digital tools. Uh, we will implement blended learning or whatever. Uh, so it's about commitment and acceptance by everyone who is included. And um, I've seen that like in several situations. So there's always some kind of resistance. Like I have to do it, but I don't want to, and I don't want to get too deep into this topic because I'm not ready for it, I'm not interested. And it often has to do with what Professor Kariakos uh, mentioned, the, uh, like we need training for teachers. Um, sometimes it, ha it has to do with, okay, the setting or the, the strategy is not ready yet, uh, or it's not mandatory. For example, for students, we offer extra um, online, for example, online modules that are not mandatory. And we noticed that students, only like the high level students use them, but the other students just ignore them. So it somehow has to be mandatory and university has to provide all the resources, all the conditions. So we need appropriate platforms, we need technical support. There must be some kind of benefit or reward for teachers as well. I mean, either monetary benefit or I don't know, flexible working hours or whatever. But um, we can't just say, okay, you, you keep on working the way you worked before, but now you use just a, a different, yeah, like a different method. So I think there has to be done a lot more than, yeah, just saying, okay, now we are going to implement it next week and we see how it works. There's lots of changes that need to be made. Lots of valid points that we have brought to the table here. Uh, for this uh, for this um, topic. We'll move on to the next slide and to make sure that we have time to discuss all our topics. So here we'll be taking a look at the different benefits and challenges of blended learning. We've already mentioned some of them in the previous slide um, and I think we can go into depth here. Um, we have a few points already mentioned but feel free to highlight any other points that come to your mind as well. Yeah, um, I, would, I, I, I would add one key point to both sides and that is um, the abundance of data that that blended learning produces. Um, blended learning um, necessarily means that we are um, working in the digital space and working in the digital space means uh, producing data, lots of data, clicks and login times and login durations and and downloads and all, all, all stuff like that. Um, um, points, point, points in a video where students stop watching the video. So there are there are literally myriads of 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 data points that we can generate and and that we do generate with the with blended learning. 
And in my experience, very few people who concern themselves with designing modern cu modern curricula um, with the help of blended learning um, ideas and technologies think about using these data points to improve uh, their their um, their classrooms and their idea of blended learning and their concepts of blended learning. Um, Professor Kuviliotis does this. Um, um, others do this too. But most most um, most lecturers I know simply use the standard learning uh, or te te teaching evaluation surveys that that students have been filling out for for one or two decades now um, without without benefiting from all these these additional de data points this do this does not mean that more data is necessarily good data but we have these these data points and uh, so so w we should try to learn from them and this uh, this this addresses the point of 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 learning analytics and educational data mining um, so I would I would add this to the to the benefits, but also to the challenges, because to find good data and to find meaning within um, uh, this 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 cloud of, of of data points that that we and our students produce is a is 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 a difficult difficult challenge. If if I may add to this, uh, uh, which I couldn't agree more. Uh, and to give you a classic example, I have observed a, a lot of uh, lecturers and professors around the world now, uh, when they try to shift next day from the traditional learning to the to go to a synchronous platform to Zoom, WebEx, uh, Skype for Business, it doesn't matter. They actually try, well, most of them, not all of them, uh, but but most of them, they try to follow exactly the same pattern as they did in the conventional lecture, even using the same PowerPoint. Uh, as I said before, th this is not the, the case, and uh, they, they, well, mainly it wasn't their fault actually, because if they weren't trained before, if they didn't know all these opportunities, and if they haven't endorsed them themselves and believe in them, then of course they continue to do the only thing that they, they knew already. But imagine all the new opportunities that this method um, is giving us. Um, maybe one of the things that the current um, uh, public health crisis is going to uh, left behind is that we had to adjust ourselves very fast uh, and in education in particular to, to this kind of methodology. So um, it is compulsory for many all educators to start learning other forms of delivering the didactic methods. And this legacy give us a good opportunity to start building on that. So uh, what Julia said, if, if, I, if I may extend that, in order to move one step further, we need to take two steps back. Okay, the crisis and also the extended use of technology helps a lot, but we have to do it properly. It's the same as it, uh, it happens in the political uh, sphere in the European Union, discussions about the future now. Uh, maybe you need to step a little bit uh, uh, behind and back in order to, to move uh, in a more steady pace um, in, in front. And the other thing that we should also add to also to benefits and to challenges is that blended learning also provides a sense of customization to each individual student. So that's another area um, that is more associated to what we call with education on demand. And maybe that's the next stage, together with using all the web 3.0 tools in education. As you know, that's the products of the fourth industrial revolution. And we have discussed this in the past as well. But um, um, even just to do a brainstorming of all this, um, and put them down in some new methodology set of uh, of tools. Uh, everybody wins. So I think that the future looks great as far as uh, we try to do them in a proper way. Back, back to you, Jackson. Julie, anything you would like to add, or 
if, if not, we can move on to the next slide. Up to no, you. you can move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because we have already mentioned a few things in the last previous slide, so I'm aware of it. Let's go into the next slide. And the next slide, we'll be talking about uh, global education. What does the future of global education look like? That's a that's a new webinar by definition, I guess. Uh, well, we could, we, could, we could have that as one of our topics for the upcoming webinars. <laughs> Yeah, and you can see from this slide and 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 the future of global education. And uh, personally, I, I can I can provide an example how the future would look like because we we are already there, uh, and the time frames are now very uh, congested. So um, the future doesn't wait in a sense. So to give you an example, in uh, many of my student groups, we're using avatars and we have designed uh, a virtual campus in the Second Life software, for instance, and we're doing lectures there. And since Julia is a psychologist, um, uh, a lot of companies, they are using the same method for uh, organizational behavior and especially Professor Griecos, your, your screen is frozen. I can't hear him. Professor Griecos, can you still hear us and see us? No, I think his 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 internet connection um, went went a yes. bit slow. Too too many Netflix users. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, you're back. I can see you're back. Okay, so uh, I said that uh, even for organizational behavior, this kind of, uh, of learning, uh, it is it also provides a, a very helpful set of uh, of tools and instruments, and it's uh, it's I don't know if it's just a few beginning of that, but it's something new. And something that is based on what the new generation knows, which is to 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 use games. So that's why it goes based on what we call gamification, which is another uh, new area. So you see, you we hardly have time to interpret all this. So imagine that's why I also said before that we need to to make a couple of steps back. Um, there are so many great things that are happening and are applied in education right now that if we find some ways to endorse them in our existing uh, educational frameworks, um, it, it will be fantastic. Uh, I remember when I did my PhD many years ago in a UK university, I really wanted one book and had to wait for two months until they brought this book for me from the um, library of the University of Chicago. So imagine that scene, well, I'm not that old, but that, that was that was happening. Imagine that with what we're having right now, access to most of the uh, libraries uh, in the world. Um, and, and if somebody uh, actually said to me a couple of years ago, okay, in uh, let's say five years, you will teach your students using an avatar, you would probably think that this is science fiction. So our kids, uh, I don't even want, well, I don't know actually, how teaching is going to be in the next 20 years. Probably with holograms or with artificial intelligence and I, I, I don't know, but challenges are here. Dr. Marta and Yulia, what's your take mm -hmm. on? Maybe let me add something. Uh, I agree with Professor Kariakos. There's a lot of potential and a lot of yeah, ideas come to our mind when talking about uh, what will the future look like. But I also would like to add that um, like students, for example, don't just use um, digital uh, tools because they have access to them. I think, um, well, we in general, we have access to a lot of digital tools, but uh, we also must ask ourselves, okay, um, what can I do with this tool? What's the purpose? And how can this tool help me to get to my learning goal? So if it's not helpful for me, I won't use it. If, for example, if a teacher says to me as a student, uh, 
I don't know, uh, please communicate uh, online. You have, I, I will provide you with a chat, um, with a chat box, and then you can write down your ideas. And I prefer to do it face to face or maybe with camera uh, online. Um, then I will definitely not use the chat. So it's not only about like so there are so many digital tools, but we also have to filter and sort them. So what do I want to achieve, and how can I use this tool to yeah to get to my goal? Dr. Marta, do you, do you want to add something? Say anything? Well, um, I think that 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 for me, um, the future of global education is very local, in fact, because at, at least in 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 Germany, we still uh, see that students are not that mobile. They do not have the mobility that that we expect at at uh, here here in Aachen. Um, about 60% of our students um, were born within 100 kilometers um, around the, the, the uh, around the university. Um, this has improved uh, a few decades ago. This was uh, the the radius was was much narrower. But I I I, I would assume that that this is the case for many G German universities. Um, we also see in in in, in the current crisis, how valuable um, the in-class time is, and that uh, and and that lecturers um, desperately strive to to uh, to recreate the 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 direct in-class experience for students by using Zoom or 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 other web conferencing web conferencing systems. So um, I I I I would assume that. That learning of of the future is still face to face learning, um, at least a part of it, so that the local aspect of learning will still be be uh, highly prevalent also also in in the future. Um, what will change? I I think is that that students have have the opportunity to um, to enjoy the teaching that that happens outside of their own universities. So they have means of comparison between their own teachers and, and teachers online. And probably most of the time, teachers online will be better or more entertaining or whatever. So, um, so we, we create these, this, this new area of, of, of competition between teachers. And I hope that this will lead to, to many lecturers realizing that they do not need to 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 recreate the basics of 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 calculus for the for the umpteenth time but just use learning materials that are well designed well thought out and available from 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 other sources in their own courses uh, so i this this whole idea of of open educational resources for me, is is one of the embodiments of of, of of the globalization of teaching and learning. I think the next slide will talk about um, the future of blended learning. So we've already spoken about the future of global education and how do we incorporate the future of blended learning in this? So where do we see blended learning in this? Would be our final point. Discussion. Yeah. Yeah. For me, the the. the the most salient point is, is the first one: the use of of of, of artificial intelligence, however intelligent that may be, um, for me is one of the key developments that that we will see um, in the future. Because this this is something that the university can can develop um, or um, or import from from yeah. from companies or or other vendors and that can be easily easily rolled out to their students without their students um, having the need to buy new hard new hardware whereas with virtual reality and augmented reality the cheapest virtual reality um, glasses that that allow you um, a well a a a fine experience uh, are around 
400 euros, which is $400. So this is very expensive. And, and I, I do not expect students to buy that gear to, to participate in, in, um, in their courses. With the current crisis, we, we, uh, we gather a very, I think, representative picture about the hardware resources that students have. And they are not as good as we thought. Students have, have, have problems with Wi-Fi, they have no, no webcams, they have no, no powerful enough notebooks. So um, it, it is, it is not, not, all, not all golden out there. So I, I, I would imagine that if, if we employ virtual and augmented reality in, um, in, in teaching, and there is potential for that, that the university needs to buy that gear. So to me, at least for the foreseeable future, let's say in the, in the next five years, I, I do not see these two technologies gaining, gaining traction um, for a majority of students. There are very, very nice, nice use cases for those two, but both the development of learning environments, the programming, as well as the consumption of uh, and, the, and, and, the, and the participation in such environments is highly expensive and I think for students um, prohibitively expensive. Very valid point. For the Quirikus, Julia, would you like to add anything to, our, to that point? Well, I totally agree with you, Malta, and I think there's, uh, or I hope that in future, um, yeah, so uh, blended learning can face like the problem we have with direct communication. I mean, social communication in terms of you're sitting opposite or next to the other person. Uh, so it's about, it's again about motivation. It's about like how can students focus. So communication has like a very high impact and I hope that in future with with the with artificial intelligence or virtual reality that it will be possible to face this problem that we are having now for example now we have been doing home office for for I don't know six seven yes. weeks um, yeah and and, and uh, there's one there's something missing I mean there, there's missing the the direct contact with uh, with people and I hope Somehow in future we can yeah we can overcome this problem and uh, create create something to to face it. Professor Kriakos, anything you would like to add to this point? The Professor Kriakos, I think the uh, screen is frozen. It's frozen at the moment. Let me add one 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 thing. Um, I I think only only artificial intelligence, um, or or at least uh, adaptive algorithms, um, allow us to realize one of the promises that 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 we um, hear since the advent of the idea of of blended learning, and that is to provide personalized learning experiences to all our students. With a with a high number of students, this is almost impossible. For teachers, um, I I don't see how how our lecturers um, in 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 engineering, when faced uh, with lectures where 1,500 people are attending, um, should be able uh, to provide a personalized learning experience. This is highly difficult, and and it does in most cases not scale well with with the size of the audience. So only artificial intelligence and 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 providing um, um, uh, well uh, specific learning materials to learners who who by some algorithm have been identified to need exactly these these materials to to, to improve their learning is is a feasible way to uh, to implement these this this um, the scalability of, of personalization. Very good point. Professor Griekos? Uh, I hope I'm not frozen now. No, at the moment we can hear you. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so I, I, I wanted to say that um, the platform or uh, the, any platform or any teleconference software is not that important. We will always have platforms, some of them will be better or evolved in the future. The model and the methodology is important. Um, so without a solid uh, methodological background, any plan of enhancing future education plan is going to fail. So that's why we need to um, trust the people that they have worked very hard in these particular areas and try to, to reverse, as we did with flip classroom and the model, try to reverse and make all the disadvantages and all the challenges of uh, contemporary education, make them better and progress. And, and, and let's say flipped uh, the actual SWOT analysis that we did on that. So this is the real challenge, uh, which is in front of us. And you will see that um, the current uh, health crisis that we are facing um, is not probably going to be the last that the world is going to experience. So um, it is in our mentality to try to use these challenges in a progressive way. So uh, I'm very happy that uh, most of the colleagues here and uh, to many of the people that I have talked lately, they share this kind of enthusiasm in order to, uh, to try to provide to, to our students the best educational uh, practices and norms that we can. And we now have all this data that, uh, that Malta mentioned. And if, if this crisis is going to leave something positive behind as well, it's all this data that we are having now. That's a lot. Plus the fact that we should start enjoying um, the simple things that we all used to take for granted in the past. Uh, and that's also a lesson for, uh, for all of us and uh, especially for educators. This, this is, by the way, one, one of the key insights that, that many of our students uh, feedback to us, um, that, that they, that they um, are, are seriously developing a new appreciation for, for presence learning and, and that they see uh, how, how different learning and teaching is when you have to do it completely on your own uh, and only are able to communicate with with your teachers um, by digital means so they they have gained a new appreciation for 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 what many of my colleagues are doing with them in the classroom a very positive note um we're slowly coming to an end to our time so um we'll wrap it up gently and we have also had a very valid um positive keynote at the end so on that lovely note it's been a really interesting discussion insightful as well um julia dr malte and professor kuriakos thank you so much for sharing insights and expertise with us it's been a pleasure to have you here yeah, same here thank you for inviting us thank you and to our viewers thank you for joining us today we hope you have been uh, you have enjoyed our interesting and exciting discussion about blended learning we look forward to seeing you again for our next series of bsbi webinars um bsbi dialogues webinars and uh, stay tuned and be safe. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.